best for Alabama. Uh, when we, when God gave me this vision to put this conference on, one of the things that I thought about was, you know, what are some of the issues that uh, we face as church members, as leaders of the church, as youth ministers, what are the things that we really need to give focus to? And as I saw the Lord about it, of course, you know, the ideas of what we've done in the past came to mind, how we've instructed our youth on, you know, how to uh, exercise abstinence and talk to them, have the real talks. Uh, but the Lord touched my mind uh, one morning and reminded me that we are responsible for fulfilling the Great Commission. And as a, as, as a believer in Christ Jesus, we need the knowledge, we need the empowerment, we need everything possible to help us advance the kingdom of God. It was so, uh, such a blessing to be a part of the strategic planning session for our diocese. And one of the things that we talked about was developing that mission statement, redefining our vision, and that is ultimately to advance the kingdom of God. And so John is going to share with us today uh, the vision that the Foundry has established and exactly uh, how we can take some of the same information take it back to our communities and make an impact. So let's give John a round of applause. And God bless you for being here with us today. Thank you, John. Thank you so much, Bishop. I'm so glad to be here. Uh, again, my name is John Rowland, and I work at Foundry. Uh, I, I'm very proud of this ministry. I, my role is fundraising and marketing for them. And we have about, uh, it's a wonderful program. It's been in existence since 1971. And we just finished, we just had our, our biggest fundraiser of the, of the year last week. Uh, Nick Saban owed one of our board members something big. We're not sure what, but we're grateful for it. And uh, he spoke uh, last week. We had about 700 people at our uh, leadership breakfast. He spoke, and we were able to raise money and provide the families. What I've given you all handouts, um, talking about numbers, talking about the program, I just wanted to start with how many of y'all uh, have been affected in some way with addiction. Family members, friends, loved ones. Mm -hmm. I have. Mm -hmm. How many of y'all have struggled with what to do with your loved, with loved ones, friends, family that struggle with addiction? I sure have. Well, today we're talking about what is working for the Foundry. The Foundry has taken a while to develop and cultivate. It is a wonderful ministry. We call it uh, the Foundry Way, and uh, it is a self-sustaining program. We're, we're working on being totally uh, self-sustainable. We don't have to rate, we have to depend to, to keep the lights on by raising money. But uh, today, so today I, I have some videos. We had some issues with them playing, so let me try. And if it doesn't work, then we won't do it. But. Uh, Our videos are not showing well. So, long and short, I was going to show three video clips, commercials we put on, uh, and we ran a, ran a campaign called Was It You? Um, with the hashtag Was It You? Was It You that provided the rechange line? Was It You that provided the meal? We do uh, a lot of ministry that helps the disadvantaged, the addict, the broken, uh, and so these three commercials were highlighting that. Uh, our mission is to restore hope and rebuild the lives of the addict, the ex-inmate, and the destitute through Christ-centered community rescue. We have three R's. Rescue, recovery, and reentry. And we're all about those three R's. Uh, rescue, we are rescuing those that uh, need a meal, are, are struggling with, uh, are, are struggling every week. We feed between four to five hundred, four to four hundred fifty people a week. 
Um, we have a, a food pantry that goes out in the community. We'll collect a lot of food from uh, grocery stores, from other places that will donate just maybe it expired um, a day or so. We feed once a week in, on campus for those in the community. Uh, and then we have our food pantry that goes out four, uh, three times a week throughout the community. Uh, and that's when we feed four to five hundred, four to five hundred people. Uh, one of the things that we do with our rescue is we, we are very adamant about um, not just endless rescue, but we want to move them in a process. So that those that we feed during the week, uh, after three meals, we have them come through a case study where we, we ask them, what's your financial situation how can we help? What cycle are you struggling with? And, and then in that process, as we begin asking questions, they will say, well, uh, X, Y, Z, whatever their issues are, we begin to help them. And uh, some, some will, will balk at that, say, I'm not talking about it. And, but that's one of the requirements, is if, if you want to keep our rescue assistance, we want to help with your situation, understand what you're going through, see how you can fit in our program. Uh, our recovery, I'll talk more about that, but as a 12-month program, uh, we believe in work therapy, is very, in building a person, a man and a woman, uh, we'll have between 250, 2,500 to 3,000 people come through our program every year. Uh, one of the big things that we emphasize is uh, we have three main phases. Uh, I, I, I'm wearing a lantern. Uh, it's a burgundy color, but that's not an employee. But we have those that are going through the program, we'll have a name, and uh, the different, in each color responds to their phase. Phase one is when they're first walking in there. And one of the big things is we do counseling, we do celebrate recovery, we will do, uh, <clears throat> oh, thank you so much. We will walk them through a process, and during the day, they will work usually about five hours at one of our enterprises. We have uh, three, and now soon to be four thrift stores around Metro Atlanta, Metro Birmingham, and we have a farm where they come and they uh, grow crops, and we sell some of those, as well as auto dealers. And those enterprises, as they're working, we're counseling, we, they, we take breaks, we counsel them, we counsel them in the morning, we counsel them at night. We have a program called the Genesis Program, Genesis Process, that they go through as they're learning about trust, rebuilding trust, gratitude, and we're peel, peeling the onion. Usually an addiction is revolved around uh, something else. It is, the addiction is just showing what's going on on the inside. You know, it's a manifestation of maybe abuse or neglect or something. Sadly, you'll see a 50-year-old man that's, that's struggling on drugs and it all stems from maybe a bad relationship with his dad when he was 10. Or a woman that's struggling with, with drugs and alcohol or what have you. And it stems from, sadly, a, a sexual abuse as a, as a youngster. And so peeling the onion, figuring out, not necessarily, all these things are you're kind of acting crazy, doing these, these things, acting out. What's the, what's the root cause of it? And we do that. One of the big things that we emphasize is uh, reshape lives by the hand of God. And so when people come out of our programs, it's not just we got y'all drugs, but as we have, with the hand of God, reshaped your life. And so our success stories are people who have gone and go, they go on and become successful in their life. Uh, we were formed in 1971, a recovering alcoholic, uh, Reverend Bob Bell, started. Um, 1996 is when we took on the um, took on the, the foundry idea beyond just um, it was initially just the best for rescue with feeding meals not just but it was a tremendous ministry but feeding meals feeding the homeless and then it became more of a of a cycle to where we turned to the foundry to where there's work therapy to where we're self seeking to be self sustaining and to where then we have graduates recovering from addiction. And our, our fearless leader was uh, Reverend Bill Knights. He, uh, he, we have a book that he's, he just put out. It's called The Yes Journey. And uh, he sensed God was leading him to do this calling to come to Bessemer and do this. And he said when he finally said yes, God blessed his journey. And in the process, we started with a small building. And he said God is calling us to build it, to take over that dilapidated Kmart. It's 100,000 square feet. And we're going to put a thrift store there. Right? Are you crazy? Is what people were telling me. I'm, and telling him that I'm supposedly. And he said, no, this is what God's called us to do. And in the process, it's, <clears throat> it's grown from a, we've grown from a $200,000 budget in 96 to a $7 million budget today. Uh, 
and that is through our sustainable pro process, uh, thrift stores, and the farm, and our auto dealership, as well as uh, with the donations and support. About 60% of our revenue, uh, of course, 100 it all goes back into the program. 60% of the revenue is from our uh, from our thrift stores, from our farm, from our uh, auto dealership. 40% are from grants and fundraising. But Bill Hines, uh, he's still there. We just had a transition where, uh, what a beautiful situation. He was, of course, we see him as the founder of the foundry uh, and led us from 200,000 budget to 7 million, making that kind of impact. And he said, God has called me to retire. And instead of him uh, hanging on to his 80 and fighting and clawing and taking the, the ship down with him, they had a peaceful uh, pass, passing of the torch to a younger man, it's my boss, Mike Andrews, and Pastor Bill is still there, it's our chief spiritual officer, and uh, he wears a hat, as, he's a founder, so if he wants something, we always do exactly what he says, but uh, <laughs> but the running of the, running of the show, but making sure the trains run on time, is my boss, Mike Andrews. 2004, we, they, they uh, uh, took over, expanded, took over the Mr. Dining Room, and then we became the the Foundry Thrift Store we relocates and becomes Alabama's largest thrift store. 2016 is my boss, Malachi Andrews, uh, took over and we doubled our capacity. We built a uh, dorm and, and, and Coleman. The amazing thing is as they began, uh, in 96, there was one small building. It was the best of a restaurant. And uh, the idea was to, to grow that horse and sadly, you know, how God can use sadly churches around downtown Bessemer were dying. And uh, they didn't know what to do with the building and their facilities and their congregations. So um, Pastor Bill reached out to them and said, we'll turn those buildings around. And so uh, there was one church, First Alliance Methodist, I think, and they had a sanctuary. They had a, a nice courtyard fenced in, and then they had this all this offices and Sunday school classrooms. And they had very few people coming. They said, we'll take it over. And so the founders took it over. And now our sanctuary of 600, seats 600 people. Our, the Sunday classrooms were re, re, uh, readjusted and, and turned into dormitories for women. And then uh, the other, the business office has been turned into to our business office and transitioned to. So that was one church. Another church collapsed. And uh, we reached out and said, hey, uh, we'll take it over. And we'll use it for God's glory. And that was transitioned. Now it's a, a, a men's dorm, and the men live there. And overall, between these different churches we've taken over, and this is not a corporate takeover, but it's a, a merciful day. We reached out and said, hey, please take our building and use it for God's glory. We sleep 400 people a night. In all our 400, we have 400 beds a night. We, can, we feed, uh, and this is three meals a day, but overall we serve 1,035 meals a day. And so uh, uh, this was a vision of our pastor bill. 60% of our revenue is from enterprises, thrift stores, as I was mentioning. What we do is we uh, actively go into the community and, oh, I'm so sorry. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not looking behind me. 60% uh, of our revenue, as I said, what we do is we get actively in the community and say, would you, the Burnley area, area, like to invest in reshaping all? And so instead of people complaining, generally as we do in society, I, I sure hate to see those men and women that are homeless. Well, why don't you donate your clothes? We'll get them back to work. And they'll learn a skill, and we'll, they'll learn employment readiness skills, and that's what we do in the process is they're working. Uh, do, we have 85 different jobs they can do uh, as they're coming through the program, through the work there. 85 different, different job titles. And when they're done with our program for 12 months, they have thousands and thousands of employment readiness hours that will transition to the Department of Labor signs off on, and they walk out our door saying, I have a skill, I have maintained the job for a year, I've been clean and sober for 12 months, and this is, I am ready to be hired. Uh, enterprises are key to our sustainability. We have an auto center, and we select the wide selection of cars and trucks, and we reach out and, and to the community and say, do you have a car that you'd like a tax write-off? Donate your car, and we'll get men and women to learn uh, the skill of auto repair, and we'll train them to fix cars 
We'll then take the car that you just donated that's not running in the pile of junk in your yard, and we'll turn it around. The men and women will repair it, fix it, make it run, and we'll sell it and pour it back in the program. These men and women, reshaped by the hand of God, they are learning the skills of repairing cars uh, or selling the cars at 100% profit that goes back into the ministry and feeds them during the day, and they walk out of the program after 12 months with a skill set of repairing cars and doing 85 different jobs in our program. This is a recent graduate of this family. We have, it's amazing, we have people that, that uh, hard times that are 50 years old and been homeless their whole life really struggle. And then we have a young man that's just deviated the wrong way and messed up and with a beautiful family and it reshaped my life and was restored. Uh, someone was telling me a story the other day that's a little old granny that, you know, was mid, mid since she's 70 years old, maybe 65 years old, and just a perfect little granny, loved the grandkids, and she got addicted to the pain meds. And, uh, and her, her, her family put her in, in the program, and she was sitting in a group, and, and this has been approved to say, and she says, I don't know why I'm here. My kids just made me come. I just had knee surgery, and that's not a big deal. And uh, one of our, and talking about community, one of our, a lady who was, been on meth and she, she uh, didn't have no teeth and was really, you know, had scars of life. So, Granny, you're just like us. You're an addict. Get in the program. And, and she says, you're right. <laughs> so we don't have any children. You know, we have 18 and above. But we have, we've had men and women that are lawyers and doctors and nurses. We have just recently had a NASA engineer. And then we have guys that have lived on the street their whole life. And the amazing thing is it's a whole whole demographic that are sitting there saying, we all have one thing and we need, we've hit rock bottom and we need to have our life reshaped by the hand of God and we need to get our life back together. This is a recent graduation. We've had a, uh, since 96, we've had 100 graduations. Uh, just had our 100th graduation. And these are men and women that have completed the program. And we have a tremendous success rate uh, of people Going through, oftentimes, you know, sadly, we can't control. You take a horse to water, you can't make them drink. Uh, you know, they'll join the program, and then, sadly, they fall away, and they leave. But these are our products that we're proud of. Uh, that uh, We've had 100 graduations, just like this picture, of men and women that uh, have gone through the year, gone through the program, three phases. Phase one and two is a nine-month program. They're on campus, uh, living there, living in our dorms. The final three months, they can live off campus at one of our facilities called Aftercare, and we transition them through. Uh, they have a little more freedom, and, uh, and then our and then they and then they, they can work outside of the facilities, and uh, then they graduate after 12 months. Our 12 month program is built on the foundation of Christ centered curriculum, focused on lifelong thought, habit, behavior change. Through our Christ centered curriculum, worship services, Bible study, prayer, our recovery program. This is all God's word to leave behind past behaviors. Uh, not only that, uh, we have counseling, to peel the onion, to figure out why are they why are they doing drugs? What is it that's inside them that's causing them to act this way? And obviously, uh, Holy Spirit works in that, as well as wise, insightful counselors that are peeling the onion for them. Uh, we have life skill classes. As they're going through, they learn. We have 85 different jobs. They can work in the thrift stores. They work in these different places. They learn life skills, work skills, employment readiness. They earn their GED if they don't have one. Uh, they can get certified. We have, we have a junior college that comes on campus, and they can learn skills and get certified in these different areas. Uh, Purple business experience, employment readiness through working in their enterprises. And for the whole program, for 12 months, room and board, we feed them, put them, off comes clothe them. Uh, it's one thousand dollars for the whole year, uh, for the well, nine hundred ninety-five dollars for twelve months, one time, the whole deal. And, and oftentimes we'll have, um, and, and that's about ninety-five percent scholarship at a thousand dollars. It'll cost them almost a thousand dollars a month to keep to feed them, and clothe them, and, and uh, transport them, to transport them to our work facilities. And, and many of those are scholarship that's now in front end. But through our sustainable program, we're able to keep it. Uh, our rescue, we have a rescue truck that goes out, as I was speaking of that. We have over 400 elderly and single parent poverty stricken households are fed through our mobile pantry. And all of that, we give food, but we also give uh, dry goods out. We give clothes out for free. Um, 
and we'll, we've partnered with Target, Dollar General, um, Cato, and we'll work on some more. But uh, at the end of the day, they'll have a bunch of miscellaneous that no one likes, no one wants, and we give them a tax write off, and they give some dry goods. We just had a big diabetic uh, clinic that uh, said, We got all these random stuff. Uh, we can't sell for whatever reason, but we'll give it to you and you give us that right off and we're able to take that into the, into the hard struck areas and, and give them uh, clothes, food, uh, medical uh, opportunities as well. Um, rescue is all I've been talking about. We also have pack a snack. We feed 200 school children every weekend. Um, <clears throat> many of the children are on uh, free lunch during the week. They do, you know, and oftentimes, sadly, that they'll go home and have nothing to eat. They may eat breakfast and lunch at school, uh, and then the weekend comes and they have nothing to eat. So what we do for the disadvantaged kids, at least within our area of South Birmingham, is we provide them a backpack, and uh, it'll have a bag of snacks and food for the weekend. Oftentimes those are supplies that have been donated to us that we've collected through partnerships. Um, we also have a partnership with the UAB School of Nursing. Uh, the, uh, they run our medical clinic. Nurse practitioners, uh, certified, trained, licensed, will lead it, and in the process, they will also use it as a as a lab, a, a skilled laboratory for their students. So we can we provide full medical care for our community. Uh, I think give or take twenty five dollars, uh, no copay, no medicine, no insurance, so forth. They come get medical issues. This is what community that we we reach. And a reasonable flat fee, I think it's around $25. We have a Foundry Dental Center uh, that, uh, that is the same. We have UAB Dental School. Uh, Dean has a real affinity and love for the Foundry, and he leads it. And he'll, he and a, some licensed dentists will do the cleaning. But at the same time, they'll bring in dental students and dental hygienist students to get their training and uh, a very low cost, I think it's $25, I think it's $30. We do dental, uh, dental cleaning, dental uh, for the community as well. Re-entry, a number of years ago, there's a ministry called Change Lives Christian Center. They were in partnership with the city of Birmingham and uh, long and short, city of Birmingham said, so what are we gonna do with uh, the number of homeless people we have under the bridges and, and we wanna do something. Uh, but we don't have a solution. We don't have a plan. So long and short, a ministry developed called Change Lives Christian Center. And it was just a collection of Methodist men, a small Bible study of men, movers and shakers and men saying, let's make something happen. And they formed a ministry called Change Lives Christian Center and, and partnered with the city. We got a got uh, massive multi-million dollar grant from the Department of uh, Housing, an urban or HUD. Uh, and they built a a campus uh, downtown Birmingham sleeps about 56 people, 56 men. This this campus is only men, but 56 uh, men uh, in this after. So it's for homeless men that are drug free. And we can do a drug test for men that uh, are coming out of addiction programs, not only ours but Jimmy Hale and other addiction programs in the area that basically need a halfway house to get themselves back in society. We charge $130 a week. We provide uh, room and board, we three meals a day, transportation to the work and home. We'll find them a job. We figure out their life skills. We help them get their GD. We help them get a birth certificate, uh, social security card, uh, license, everything they need to be a fully functioning person in society. And uh, we say, you got, you got to work. We're going to find you a job. You got to pay rent. Um, but in this process, and sometimes we, they'll stay uh, sometimes two, three years. We have some that are mentally dis disabled in some ways. They can work, they can pay, but be on their own is just not for the situation. They'll stay there for years. Um, like I said, our, our reentry program is a six-month program. As they, as they leave our addiction program, it's six months at our center downtown. The Christian Life CLCC is a part of the voucher we found, but it's a separate 501c3 in the fact that they take government grants. Um, they can, they say, we'd love you for you to come to Bible study, but you don't have to if you don't want to. The foundry, by God, by golly, you're going to, you're going to count, you're going to Bible <laughs> And we don't take uh, government grants, so we allow them to share the gospel doing that. But it's under the foundry auspices. Um, this is our staff in the last 12 months. Safety, environment, healing, 
2,336 uh, medical and dental center visits, uh, 281,000 meals served, 93 beds provided. This is an every night thing. Uh, 543 individuals uh, received clothing assistance. Staffs in the last 12 months, workforce, and so as they're working in our thrift stores, in our auto dealership, uh, in our farm, 377,000 employment readiness hours. So if someone's a drug addict and struggling on the streets, after a year in our program, they say, hey, I maintain a job for you. And I can do these skills. And I've got my birth certificate. And I've got a license. And I and I found out, we, we do their love language, we find out the love language, we find out what their, uh, their, their, uh, their gal strengths, what are their strengths. And so they can walk out after a year, well clothed, fed, and show that they, they don't have any, you know, they've been drug free for 12 months, and we help them find a job. And they walk out and saying, hey, I have held up a job for this many months and this many hours. Uh, educational Center, well, we get a GED. We also get certifications in the different areas of skills. And 365 vehicles repaired and flipped. Uh, the shift, 50,000 class hours, 39,000 worship center hours, 92,000 counseling hours, and uh, 169 graduates. Really proud of graduates. Uh, and I talked about their dental center, uh, $25, and it's with a partnership with the Dean of UAB School of Dental Dentistry. Our, uh, our educational center, we provide GED preparation through uh, our local junior state, junior college, uh, with tutoring and education. Um, and our nursing center, uh, the medical center, we provide uh, health, urgent health, we do this once a week, provide for diabetes, high blood pressure, heart disease tests, and for patients 14 and older. And so we, we go in, we have a clinic for that, but we also go to our re-entry center downtown with the homeless men, and we'll, and we'll have doctors and nurses and medical field, and sometimes it rotates, we do it once a week, and they come on campus. And they'll discover something that maybe a man or a woman is, has not had the opportunity for someone to find out that saves a lot. Uh, we work, we have a, a church service, 600 people, community is welcome to it, uh, but uh, we'll see 600 and we worship twice a week. And we have a praise team, a praise band, and, and a pastor that preaches every week, and uh, they really rejoice and celebrate what God's doing in their life. Uh, our active care program, as I talked about, individual counseling, classes, support, accountability. Accountability is a big thing. You know, they're, they're rebuilding trust. And we, we are tough on them, making sure they do drug tests all the time, uh, making sure they have, you know, if they fall away, they say, I messed up. We show grace, we show mercy, which got to start over. And so we raise the bar really high. And, uh, and one of the things is anyone that is a graduate of our program, they have a lifetime opportunity for counseling. So they graduate 10 years later, hey, I'm really strong. My wife and I are really, really didn't have a difficult time. What do I do? Lifetime of free counseling. Uh, I was going to show a video about the opioid epidemic. I am no expert by any means, and I, I do not speak as one. Um, I was going to show a video of, uh, of a man that's on our staff that is, but the gist of what he was saying is over the number of years, opioid addiction, speaking of uh, uh, pain medicines, that you know, my, my dad, he's 70 years old, just had shoulder surgery, uh, and they gave him basically, not literally, but about a, bu a bucket of pills and uh, uh, pain meds. And he, he used it the first day, took about two or three pills, and then he says, I'm okay, I don't, I don't think I need him anymore. And he still has a bucket left over. And sadly, uh, people, good people, church going people that are trying to live a good life, will slip into, well, I got a bucket of these pills left over. And they begin to say, well, my knee's now hurt, my back's now hurt, and you know, it's just normal life. But they begin getting addicted, it begins to change their lifestyle, it begins, they cannot exist now without those payments. And we found, and it's, they said, well, it's, it's subscribed by the doctor. You know, the doctor wrote a prescription. How could it be wrong? And, uh, and so it's becoming an explosion. And sadly, as people come, become addicted to it, uh, good people, good church people, people that are trying to live the right life, that you see all dressed up clean and uh, are now becoming drug addicts and never thought it would be. And then again, doctor shopping. Saying, well, I got my home my, my primary doctor, and he, he prescribed these things. Well, I'm going to go shop with this other guy and go and tell him my story to him or her. 
Hey, doctor, my back's hurting. All right, let me give you some pain medicine. Well, then they go stop someone else. Doctor, my back's hurting. Da, da, da. They give us more pain medicine. And they're good-hearted people trying to do the right thing. The next thing you know, they're hooked. And uh, we've seen, uh, since 2000, the death rate from opioid overdose, overdoses has increased 200%. And 2014, 61% of drug overdose deaths were opioid-related. Ten years ago, it was cocaine. 20% methamphetamines, a very little heroin at that time, uh, and now 75% of people coming in are addicted to opioid drugs or heroin. Simply taking the pain medicines and then exploding from there. Um, our founder way is five steps. Yield. They gotta say, <laughs> no boss. Uh, I'm an addict. Uh, very much, you know, I, I, my name is John, my life's a disaster, and I'm pretty brought by. They got a year. And they got to really uh, agree to change, begin to change, take the classes, being so dry and so clean so Pursue. Part of that process is work therapy. We believe work therapy is effective. It is getting men and women confidence to say, by golly, I, I worked today. I worked a full day. I wasn't strung out on drugs somewhere. I worked and I got things done, I got things accomplished, and I sold merchandise, I dealt with people, I, I fixed a car, the car is running now, and they walk through, uh, and, but they got to pursue it. And then discover them. They got to discover them. They're discovering them. Their identity is no longer the drug addict, no longer the, the alcohol, but I'm a child of God. God has a purpose for me, has a plan for me. I have meaning. There's a reason I'm here on this globe, on this earth. Because uh, God has called me, put me, in, and used me. And in the process of changing, and, and, and the, we're peeling an onion and figuring out, you know, all that drug acts now really stems from ten years, when you were 10 years old. Mm -hmm. Let's face that. You're only, as sick as you're, sick, you're only as sick as your secrets. So let's figure out what is that that's causing you to do all this crazy stuff. And uh, you get to peel the onion in a uh, safe environment. They say, you know, I've never told anybody this, but my uncle abused me. Or, you know, my next door neighbor did this to me. No one knows this, but, and they begin to, in a safe, healthy environment, begin to peel the onion and figure out right there. That, that's, that's why for the last 40 years you've acted this way. Discover the gift and then give. We're like, hey, you can't just uh, take, 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 and say this. Some people get addicted to uh, therapy. Again, addicted to complaining, addicted to, to sitting and, and you know going to a counselor saying, "Woe is me," and we're like, "No, no, you got to get get up, and you got to get back." <clears throat> so our work, our our program participants are in the community and supporting uh, and giving back, and so uh, then it's the cycle. Um, our frequently asked question: What services do you provide uh, for the community? We provide emergency food boxes. We provide clothing vouchers, fire loss vouchers, natural disaster vouchers, community meals. Um, we also offer job skills training, job fair opportunities. Uh, we do not provide financial assistance. We will not give anyone a big sweaty wad of cash, but uh, <laughs> but we will give them the, the, the support they need. And if, if they're living under a bridge, by God, well, come on, get in the program, be drug free. Uh, we'll help you get a job, give you the skills you need. You get a job, then you pay us rent, and uh, you got to have accountability. You got to learn some more skills. Uh, we're gonna get, get you back on the feet and make you a productive part of the community, and you got to get back. So, uh, what documents do you res uh, require to receive assistance? Uh, proof, photo ID, social security card, proof of income. Uh, we develop all these with you. And how do you uh, receive help? Call two zero five four two four Hope. Start the process. Addiction recovery, frequently asked questions. How much does it cost? $995 for 12 months. The program's one year. Um, it said, My judge is requiring a state funded rehab program. We're not state funded. We are uh, because our, our CLCC, our, our, our separate 501c3 for the homeless or injured men, are uh, state funded, but our foundry program is not. And that the reason for that is we want to be able to share the gospel and uh, without, without any hindrance. 
And we're not state funded. We are faith-based recovery program, supported by donors and income from our enterprises. We do not receive any funding to depend on us from sharing the gospel. Um, <laughs> Y'all have any questions? Yes, ma'am. Literally, will come 
Um, we're across the street from the parole office. And, we, and, the, and the judge will say, okay, so either you can spend the next 10 years in jail or you can go to the foundry for 10, 12 months. Which, just choose your office. Which door do you like? And they'll come up in a police car with chains on, ejected from the prison. And they've been in sitting in prison for 10 years. And they unlock the chains and say, start the program. So, I don't know how willing they are, but they're there. I don't know the step. I, I, I can't tell you. I'm, I'm sure there'll be a lot smarter than me. But from what I've found is they have to reach a point in their own life to say, I'm going to give it a try. If that makes sense. They got to get right. The, 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 one of the best things is they got to get right. I'm trying to get a friend of mine in, and uh, she's doing some crazy stuff. Dear friend of my wife, and uh, I've asked the counselors to talk to us as just as a person. You know, how can I get my friend to help? They're like, does she want it? No, no. And she, I said, no, she doesn't. Has she ready to hit rock bottom? No. Well, she's probably not coming. They said we'd love to have her. But, so. I work with uh, the LGBTQ population, which I can deal with substance abuse and mental illness. And one of the things that at my at the facility where I work, that not only acknowledgement, but also you might want to consider hospitalization. So, like, uh, <laughs> you know, consider hospitalization because you're looking at not only the attributes of the addiction, which could lead to other attributes of mental illness, which could be uh, symptoms of schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, uh, various types. So I would, you know, encourage if that's what you have to deal with, you know, of course the acknowledgement, try to uh, be um, sincere in what you're saying and let them see that the addiction is a problem. He didn't try hospitalization. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That's a question up front. And I, and I would add, one of the, we are not a um, medical facility. Uh, people have to, if they're, say they're a drug addict, say they're whatever, they have to uh, go through detox. We'll work closely with the medical facility. And I'm, I know at times I've seen, I've witnessed just as an outside, and I'm speaking from the foundry, I'm speaking as a person, that. Um, Sometimes it's court order for them to go somewhere. And they may not like it, but once they're detoxed, and they've got through that, then they may be open to what they're doing. I'm not speaking to the founders on that one, but we, we do not do the detox. We do not do the medical, because they, they will die if we're, without medical help, the detox. But we work in tandem with medical facilities. Once they finish the detox, we'll take it. All right. <clears throat> uh, I heard you say about the 600 seat sanctuary, and my question is: Are most of the you know, members of the church are they recovering addicts, or you know, are they just a community-based church? What's your method of evangelism? And also, you know, for the most common Christian who lives a, a, a lifestyle of going to church and going to work, going home, taking care of their families, they don't they don't know about that. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Unless they're in their family, immediate family, or unless they're in the neighborhood. You know. So, what's your method of evangelism, or either marketing, or you know what I mean? Your your program. That's a great question. Um, and I must say, I started the foundry a month ago, <laughs> so, but I've done a lot of study on it, a lot of reading. I've learned a ton about it, uh, and I, and I this is but. Evangelism, the worship service, is largely our program participants. Um, we open it to the community. Oftentimes, their families will come worship with them. Um, we are a church in the sense that we worship on Sunday, that their their body of Christ work together to heal. We're not necessarily like a, your church where you're, you go on Sunday, you're free to go about, you, you volunteer in certain areas, you do certain things. Um, it is mainly a part of our work, a part of our therapy that they're worshiping and celebrating that they learn that week. We open the community. As far as evangelism, um, we do a lot of commercials on our Christian radio station. At least getting the word out. Um, we get through, through a ton of referrals. Um, it's amazing as we talk to people that it, it seems like from what we've experienced, everyone has some sort of an addict connection. 
Uh, our board is made up of the movers and shakers of Birmingham. We've got a great board, men and women that are TV newscasters, lawyers, doctors, Coke and Tile, Slick, and uh, like, what's your, tell me, how did you get found you? Well, my brother just uh, OD'd on this. My sister. And every, and they said the first one we thought of was the Foundry. Because of your commercials, because your radio spots, uh, we do mass mailers. It's been very, the money that you get, we, we turn back into, we're speeding. Every penny we get goes back to the program where we're cultivating donors. Everybody somewhere has some connection with, with addiction in some way. Our, one of the big connections to the community is the community loves our thrift stores. And so people that maybe they don't have any connection to addiction, which is few and far between, but they sure do have an old couch they'd love to get rid of. And uh, as we tell them, you're donating your couch, your couch is all beat up. We can reupholster that and sell it. And, and we're in the same way, we're reshaping lives. Like, reshaping the couch and we're reshaping lives by the hand of God and so we communicate that message through our and we collect data from people that are shop there so we'll send them these newsletters you get um, we'll send them um, radio spots social media spots some TV ads so it's just as a cycle that we're working through and, and based on our reputation over at least 21 years uh, people are recommending and sending it's Unlike many other programs, it's not cost for you. I mean, for me, a thousand dollars is super high, but for twelve months, maybe this will have to pull off. My question is: I see it's nine ninety five a year, but is there financial assistance? So every client that you have pays nine ninety five, or there's, you know, what about the homeless? What about that person who is not working uh, and needs help? So is we, there financial we, there assistance? Is, there is. There is. But we don't. We want them to. Uh, there is financial assistance. We don't want obstacles for that people to get into the program. But we don't want to feel like it's a free ride. So, so the work there is a big part of it. And uh, we don't want to say, well, I've been giving stuff my whole life. Well, now it's time for you to work, give back. But, but, but we do not put obstacles. If someone says, hey, I'm, I'm, all, I'm homeless. 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 Okay, um, you guys have a lot going on with this, just a lot of entities that you provide, which is awesome. Um, definitely strategic, we can see the hand of God with this company, this business, but just thinking about the vision of this organization and something that we're wanting to push forward is our outreach, part of our ministry. Um, there's a lot wrong with a building in a day. So what information, my question I guess, what steps can we take as an organization um, to begin a program like this? I would think uh, from what I've seen is it, it didn't, you know, Rome's not built in a day. It, 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 it's an existence. It took 21 years to get to where it is at this point in 40, or over 40 years to build a program. I would think strategic, begin with if you have a heart for the homeless, if you have a heart for those who are struggling, there are other people that have that same heart. And so what the Foundry does and the Foundry has, has been successful in is strategic partnerships. So begin to think what value add can you provide your grocery store? Well, your grocery store probably has a bunch of food they don't want to throw away, but uh, they can't sell it. They, should, they sure would like a tax write-off. And if you, or, or your local Walmart sure doesn't want to throw it away, they sure would like a tax write-off. They sure would like to look like they're good people. You know, the corporate social responsibility is a big thing. And I, I joke, uh, uh, I work for a number of nonprofits, and, and there would be companies like Cigarette for Kids. That doesn't exist, but... You know, cigarette for kids is really bad. <laughs> and they shouldn't be selling cigarettes to kids. But uh, they sure would like to be partnered with a good looking organization. And they'd like to make a difference. And they'd like to say they're empathetic in the community. So begin to think strategically with your organization, your outreach. Who could we benefit? What value could we provide at Walmart? What value could we provide? And the value could be um, you take their in a systematic, organized manner. You take junk to them, pallets of miscellaneous stuff, and begin to give it to the homeless, get them equipping the homeless. What we do is we, we don't call it, it's not a handout, a hand up, and we work and, and, and have a plan to say, okay, uh, we're going to give you things, but we want to take you, find out what your issue is, and help you to 
forward, then you can become sustainable and give to your community. And so it started with strategic partnerships with people that had like-minded desires. And then for us, we're able to help the community, business leaders say, hey, we're taking men and women off the streets and we're making them productive citizens to work, work with the community. And then they earn a salary and they pour money back into it. So it becomes an economic cycle that echoes um, ecosystem in the community. So thinking through just a very basic, all right, let's, let's address homelessness. Well, um, we can, how many beds can you sleep? Well, what do you do with those men and women? Are you just going to have men and just have women? But, but just doing something with strategic partnerships, not doing, not doing it alone. Because there's a lot of businesses and a lot of companies that could be blessed with partnering. Does that make sense? And thinking through rather than just, hey, give us, give us free stuff so we can give it out. But think through what is the value you're giving them. And it could be the value you say, all right, uh, this big corporation. Um, there's a lot of millennials. Millennials in studies say they want, they want purpose and meaning in the job. And they're not going to stay at a company if it's some dirty rotten scoundrel unless there's a purpose in that. Even though you may throw all kinds of money at the millennials, they're going to say, well, how can I give that to the community? How can I engage in community? How can I find purpose in what I'm doing? Well, you're a dad and your guy. There's no purpose in that. Let's do it. Well, the stats are showing that millennials are quitting job after job after job and not find purpose. Well, maybe you're not profit. You're, you're saying, well, dear Mr. HR, Ms. HR, we'll help find purpose for you. You partner with us, we're feeding the homeless. We got a partnership with Target over there that gives all of their junk. And so, dear Mr. Corporation, we'll provide volunteer hours for your millennials as they feed the homeless. We'll make it really easy with them. Laying yours over their arm, head, I mean, they're around their head, and they'll say volunteer. And they're feeding the homeless. And you're giving PTO time, um, allowing your millennials to feed the homeless. So you got volunteer labor. And then you work for Target or Walmart or whomever, and you got the supplies. And you just and it comes and you get the gets the middle. If that makes sense. <clears throat> but the partnership I'm developing with churches is we're still in the infancy of it, but Acts 1A. Go into Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the outer ends of the earth. What are you doing in your Jerusalem? And, and how easy are you making it, church leaders, for your people to get their hands to it? And I know I'm Baptist. Baptist. We love to outsource our missions. And so we'll put a, a poor guy up on the screen. You see this guy with a spear and a loincloth? He's in Africa, Botswana. He's living in the jungle. Tell him, tell him for Jesus. So pass the plate and give this guy in Botswana a lot of money. All right, well, thanks goodness I'm not out there with a spear and a loincloth. Go get him, Tiger. And uh, <laughs> so we outsource our missions. Long or short, what we try to do, and I try to frame it, is we want to give people a chance to scoop mashed potatoes for the homeless, to make it easy for them to impact their Jerusalem, and, and we become an extension of the church's local missions. And we do that. Uh, we allow churches, but that's something I'm working on in a systematic way. The churches can then say, and they can print. I was a pastor for many years. We love to brag about stats. So a local pastor can say, uh, you know, how many people do you have come? Well, we got 100 people in our church. We got this, that going on. How many people do you feed today? Well, there are partners. Uh, with the founder, they said, well, we fed 1,035 meals a day. And we sleep 400 people a night. It's your church? No, the foundry is part of our church. So, uh, then partner strategically with churches. And then, almost like Tom, uh, Huck Finn and Tom Sawyer, you are uh, playing on their ego and tapping into those metrics and uh, form strategic partnerships. Are there any other questions? John. <laughs> My business card's there. If you have any, uh, feel free to uh, email me. If you want the present at the PowerPoint I gave today, I'm glad they sent it to you. I'll you a link. Uh, anything we can do for you, let us know. And, uh, if you have any questions that you like, how they implement in your church, uh, just let me know. My card's there. There's our newsletter. If you want to get on the newsletter, go to our website, sign up for our updates, and uh, love to work with you.